This episode is brought to you by Portland Distro. If you like underground music, movies, and more, go to portlanddistro.com for licensed merch, vinyl, CDs, and more. Plug in the discount code 10 off T E N O F F for a 10% discount at portlanddistro.com. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Everything Went Black podcast. My fellow horseman of the podcasting apocalypse, Carl Hikara, joins us this week. It was about time to have him back on. We spoke right when he was about to launch Soul Knox. And uh, I think now is a good time to circle back, review all the work that he's done, and talk about what's in store for everyone. And also, uh, of course, there are the tangents and all that sort of stuff that is associated with this medium. Speaking of the horsemen, I want to shout out my brethren on Monday. We have Brandon Legion bringing us Horror Wolf 666. Brandon's podcast focuses on interviews of up and coming old salts and anyone involved in the horror community. We've all been uh, guests on this show as well. So, I mean, there's also us giving our lists and things like that. And uh, that's part of the whole vibe of the, of the Horsemen anyway, as we all guest on each other's shows. On Tuesday, Grandmaster Jackie Smith brings us into the Necrosphere, the premier extreme music podcast. Wednesday, of course, is Everything Went Black. I return on Thursday with Mike Scandato and Jeff Kashid for Necromaniacs. We uh, pretty much just talk shit about movies. <laughs> There's no interviews on that one. So uh, we cover different ground than Brandon. And of course, Sunday brings us Carl Hikara's Soul Knox. And we're going to talk about that on this episode. I also want to give a shout out to new Patreons. We have Kai Wood. Dave, I'm going to call him English Dave, and Selden. They just joined the crew. And if you're curious about how you can support Everything Went Black, you can join our Patreon. And for as little as $1 a month, you get bonus content. For $5 a month, you get the bonus content plus early access to all of the episodes. And for $20 a month, you can become a sponsor. You can promote your business, your band, your project, your own podcast even. Well, Carl, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, you know, you're one of the four, well, is it four or are we more than four now? Horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, well, I mean, I, I got to see there's the, in the neck of fear, uh, horror wolf, everything went black. Uh, Necromaniacs yeah. and then so so were five five horsemen. <laughs> so like the four horsemen is kind of like a, a conceptual thing, you know. Even though there's yeah. definitely more than four of us, because you figure if you look at all the participants of this whole thing, there's me, you, that's two, Jackie, Brandon, right, yeah. Mike, that's five already, <laughs> and then we have and uh, Ralph and Jeff. So we yeah, got Ralph seven Jeff, dudes. Yeah. Seven dudes, yeah, collectively known as the four horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. <laughs> uh, or I always just call it the horsemen of the podcast apocalypse. That's probably like, a better, better uh, nomenclature. I think it's more accurate. Yeah, that's what, like yeah. I was like, well, it's technically yeah. It comes from the four horsemen, but I just say horsemen of the podcast apocalypse because it's like you know, there's a bunch of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, and we're always like, um, there's always. Um, we have a lot, a lot of crossover with our listeners, and you know, end up meeting um, like people who are you know listen to your podcast, and then they listen to mine, and then they reach out to me about something. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's awesome, man. I just love the way this whole thing came together, and it's like one one of the good things that came of the pandemic, I think, was um, this whole group. You know, I mean, Jackie was talking about how he started. He really got serious about into the necrosphere over the over the pandemic and uh, I know Brandon started up over those last couple of years and um, it's just really cool how 
something so horrible as that and just soul crushing gave people an outlet, you know, and, and it's been um, positive you know, ever since then. It's like one of the things, you know, the little group that we have has definitely been a crutch for me too, man. Cause like I've, you know, in addition to the, just the downside of the pandemic, there's just been a lot of like personal difficulties that I think we've all been dealing with and having us out there to kind of support each other has been really good. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely one of the one of the benefits of the of the pandemic. Uh, I mean, like before twenty twenty, I really wasn't into podcasts at all. Like, um, I had friends who do some podcast stuff, but I, but primarily I just didn't have you know in the past I didn't have a whole lot of time necessarily to sit around and listen to podcasts because it was like, uh, uh, you know, working a job where you you know you know you have to deal with people and you can't just listen to what you want and you know, that kind of stuff. And then, uh, after the pandemic started and I kind of switched gears with, with what I work and I suddenly found I had a lot of time to listen to stuff, you know what I mean? Like I'm by myself all day. I was like, um, you get tired of listening to music after a while. And then I, I started, um, started getting in a podcast that way, you know, and, and, uh, because I was like, I, I really started by doing interviews, listening to interviews. So yeah. I remember uh, uh, what kicked it off was I found um, the interview that Jackie did with um, with Goal from uh, from Mayhem. You right. Know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I like found that that, that interview just because I was listening to all the Mayhem interviews I could find like on on YouTube or whatever, and that's how I discovered Jackie's podcast, and and then from from here, there, that's how I found yours because you know I knew Tunes as a band, like since for a while now. Like I saw you guys live back in the day, like you know, like I think 2016 or something, and it was like, but I had no idea that you did the podcast. So it was like listening to uh, the interview you did with Jackie. Like I was like, oh, okay, uh, these podcasts Mike does sound pretty interesting. Like particularly, uh, what got really got me was Necromaniacs, like. But that was, I think you were still doing Metal Matters then as well. Yeah. So that, like kind of checking out all three, you know? Yeah. that that I mean, Metal, it's it's funny. When I was doing Metal Matters, everything with Black kind of went more to the, um, the background because it was almost like competing against myself in some ways. And um, that was a right. lot of fun. It was it was great doing doing that. And uh, but the, the thing is, man, I just like got really burned out on um, the constant grind of finding uh people to interview and and um you know i mean it, it was like an actual gig you know like i was paid to do that which is kind of cool but i was oh, yeah. i also wasn't getting any any um production support you know so it was like great you know you have this like all-consuming devouring need for content every week and um you know it's all on you <laughs> so i mean every now and then yeah. it's like you know they would they would help me out with certain you know here and there you know but it wasn't like like uh initially i was like oh maybe these guys will get me in touch you know maybe i'll have a producer or something and they'll help me reach out but not nah, really it was like all up to me pretty much and uh you know and, and and i just like got really burned out with it and then i transitioned back to just doing everything went black every week and it's been better because um it's more satisfying, you know, and frankly, between the Patreon and the um, the sponsor, it's like I'm actually making more money on my own than I was on as like a freelancer for, for uh, Gimme. And um, right. Gimme is cool. I mean, they're they're great people. I, you know, I have really good relationship with everyone. Uh, I turned it over to uh, Fred Pissarro, who um, was uh, used to be editor at uh at noisy and then he had his own thing for a while and i was writing for him and i connected the fred with those guys but i, I think the podcast is uh kind of went by the wayside at this point so it's unfortunate you know yeah i noticed that. i don't think i don't think they're really doing episodes anymore <laughs> yeah that that was that's kind of i feel bad about that because i i really we we were really starting to get a lot of um pretty good audience you know and, and uh the, the thing that I didn't want to happen, I felt like kind of happened where it was like when I left, the thing just kind of fizzled out. And that's, that's, that's a bummer, you know? Right. Well, yeah. But I mean, I think, you know, probably people who are listening to it because, because of you or they like what you're bringing to it, they probably all just, uh, 
switch over to everything went black. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, the the subject matter on everything went black is way different, though. You know what I mean? It's not just metal or yeah, extreme music. Like we, you know, like you and I, we're we're talking to you and I are doing an episode just about whatever. We're talking about your your you know Soul Knox basically and. And, yeah. you know, we have filmmakers at the Adams Family on. I got, like, you know, artists and, you know, Josh Barnett was on recently. And, like, you know, he's kind of a metal guy. I mean, he's definitely a metal guy. But, he you know, it's like he's not a musician, though. You know what I mean? And uh, Yeah. Yeah. So well, like, you just had the guy from Cadaver Records. You know, like, you're, you know, everything on Black isn't specifically metal. But at the same time, there is some, you know, crossover with, like, what you're talking about in there. But, yeah not really the same and at the same time yeah <laughs> so with soul Knox, what what's uh you know i, I kind of i was excited to find out that you started doing this when we, we were making plans we had you on a while back when you were just starting out you were just planning to put this thing together all right so. yeah i think when i think when um when you had me on it was kind of corresponding to when i launched the podcast so mm-hmm. i probably had I probably just did my first episode or something, but at that point, and um, yeah, the and I mean that was like I think July, if I remember correctly. It went by kind of fast. Like, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny because when you when you start start something, I kind of had a, I set myself out with something that's a little bit more open, anyways. You know, to cover like different things. So, um, you know, in that in that case, it's kind of come come out the way I wanted to because it's cause we're covering a pretty wide range of stuff. There's no real rhyme or reason to a certain extent, you know, like it's like a uh like uh in terms of like, you know, I don't know, some podcasts maybe have like a schedule like, okay, once once every month we do this type of thing or whatever, but for mine is you know, we have um kind of like like our our segment, uh, you come on a lot for the uh, elder tales. Um, you know, that's like semi regular. You know, we yeah. it's not every single month, but it's it's you know pretty often, close to every, close to once a month. But sometimes it's every other month. You know, like but it's that's kind of recurring segment where we're talking about weird fiction. You know, and and that was one of the things I really wanted to hit when when I started the podcast was like. Uh, I really wanted to talk about weird fiction. That was an important part of it. And um, and then, um, you know, it took, it talked about, we talked a lot about horror stuff since it started. You know, like, that's another thing that seems to be common. I kind of, like, um, it's kind of funny how when you start a podcast, you, you know, you might have an idea, and um, as it's progressing, it kind of develops itself, and, you get more confident doing it. I definitely feel like a lot more confident. Like say I'm recording my intros by myself or doing a solo episode. I definitely a lot more uh, confident now than it was when I first started, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, man. It's hard to sit there and talk by yourself, man. It's really difficult to do something like that. Yeah. It takes a little bit of getting used to and, and um, yeah, you kind of get used to, maybe you get used to it, but uh, I do prefer having the guest episodes, um, I've done some during the during the holiday. It was just too hard for me to schedule people because my work. So I was doing uh, solo episodes during December a lot. But you know, so far I've had um, like you know, podcast like has had um, a lot of the horsemen are all recurring guests. You know, <laughs> like I think uh, and I'm planning on having Mike Scandato and um, I'm gonna ask Jeff if he wants to come on as well in the future but um i got a day date books for for mike to come on as well because they'll end on you know have all the all the horsemen come on um and then some of my other friends the kind of semi-regulars you know which is good to have some people you can count on to come on and talk about certain subjects you know what i mean yeah it's it's good it's good to have people you're you're comfortable talking with like sometimes that's that's one of the things about um guests that you don't know if you're going to interview somebody you know it's like uh it takes a while to warm up and figure out what the flow is but it's like when it's you or jackie or you know ralph is a regular on this thing or when i talk with mike and jeff at necro it's like we're so used to talking to each other that the thing just gets underway quicker and it's way more comfortable and i think more because it's more comfortable it's more enjoyable for people to listen to 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, for the most part on the pod, my podcast, it's it's I try to kind of have more of a subject. I mean, I do have episodes that are about whatever. Like when Ralph's been on the first two times, it was kind of um, open conversation. And then yeah. um, like well, when I had Nas, you know, from Aquis on, it was kind of an open conversation, you know. And uh, and I'm cool with that. I like having those as well. But um, you know, a lot of the ones I do, I'm I'm trying to. Um, have a kind of subject that I want to hit and, um, and, uh, you know, and that's generally stuff that, that I, that I personally like or interested in. And the podcast kind of ends up being a little bit like, um, whatever, I, what, what I'm, what I'm into in that moment, you know what I mean? Ends up being, being the podcast, you know? So. <laughs> Cause originally one, one of the, the main subjects was, uh, the occult and, you know, it's kind of esoteric sort of stuff. And it's, uh, you know, that stuff's really interesting and uh, you know, I'm also interested in that kind of stuff. But I feel like you've you definitely expanded beyond that, and like to include other things that are a little bit more. Um, you could find probably other people to discuss these subjects with too. You know. Yeah. Well, I want to. You know, I always kind of had in my mind to have like um, a spectrum of things to talk about. You know, just to talk about my interests. Like I didn't want to like specifically just be. Um, uh, tied to one thing with the podcast, like even when I started it, I was always in the intention was to be about like the occult and Satanism and uh, and uh, weird fiction and horror and black metal and you know all this kind of stuff. You know, um, I definitely kind of had the intention of of being a little bit more focused on the occult when I first started, but um, I've kind of found that that's um, having you know it's hard to find people to um you know to talk with that in a certain extent like in the sense of like um you know it's a little bit easier to talk about some of the other stuff with people you know what i mean yeah and um uh so it's kind of an undercurrent through a lot of the subjects we talk about but um you know it's it's kind of in the intention um as we go forward to maybe try to start getting some guests on that are like maybe maybe try to try to go and see if I can get some esoteric authors and stuff. Like I had one person who was supposed to be on, but then that ended up kind of falling through. At least for right now, it might happen in the future. But um, yeah, so you know, I haven't quite I haven't that 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 part of the podcast has not really hit quite hit in gear. But I'm you know I try to obviously like the episodes that we do when we do the weird fiction. I think we kind of bring that that perspective to it, which is kind of part of what I wanted to do as well was talk about, say, weird fiction from that perspective of, you know, somebody who's, like, you know, interested in the occult and stuff, because, um, which I think we do, because uh, a lot of uh, weird fiction podcasts listen to the people who are doing them that seem like kind of like they don't care about that side of things, you know? So Yeah, they're more into the literary aspects of it, you know what I mean? It seems like, um, you know, there's, like, you know, the elder sign and you know, podcasts like that. Uh, there was, there was that one that was the Lovecraftian, uh, the, the Lovecraft podcast or whatever it's called. And there was now it's something else. It's called uh, Strange uh, Studies and Strange Stories. Yes, yeah. yep. and the, and that I I still enjoy it, but when it was more focused on Lovecraft and and you know specifically that, I think it was better. Like when it was really diving into like weird authors, I thought. That was the strongest uh, version of that show. I mean, I still like it. I mean, they, they talk about a lot of other stuff, other different authors, and it, they've expanded beyond that because I guess they covered they, all the Lovecraft stories, and you know. But I kind of wish they had gone more into like, okay, now we're done with Lovecraft. Let's do like Clark Ashton Smith. Like, let's do you know. They do talk about him, but they don't. It's not all all focused on that anymore. You know. Yeah, like they did. They did kind of. After they finished Lovecraft, they started working their way through supernatural horror and literature and like stuff listed in that, which I thought was a cool idea. And then they are also mixing in. They did some stuff with Clark Ashton Smith. They did stuff with um, uh, they did some episodes of um, that's some you know like some other uh, of those kind of authors and like they did Michael Shea. That's how I found out about Michael Shea was from their podcast. Yeah, because like, they did those uh, with um, what's his name that uh, that comedian guy. I oh, his name. right, um, uh, Pat Oswalt. 
Pat Oswald, yeah, yeah. They just have episodes of that. That's how I found out about Michael Shea and checked him out. I actually, um, that, that dude is like very knowledgeable, man. Like I was surprised at how much that guy knew about like cool stuff like that, you know? Yeah, he seems to be pretty into it and like, which is cool. I mean, I don't know much about Pat Oswald personally, but um, yeah, he seems pretty knowledgeable about that. And but yeah, I, I agree with you. Like I, I prefer when they're just focused on weird fiction, you know, and, and horror fiction, like, because uh, I have a lot more limited interest in a lot of the stories that they're covering now. I mean, right now they're doing like Aikman, which is cool. Yeah. So I've been enjoying this month because it kind of feels like, you know, what they did before. Cause, I mean, they did Aikman before and stuff as well. Well, but you know, you know what, thing, man, you know, the, there's an author that is like absent from all these discussions, which I feel like you and I are about to get into, which is uh, Carl Edward Wagner, man. No one seems to, he, he's such a, prolific author and influential but is way out in the margins man he's not like a household name it seems like yeah i agree i know um uh, i know that they covered sticks but that was the only wagner story they they covered which is surprising you know because he has so many and yeah like uh he um i think part of it too is because his stuff's been out of print for so long i mean um just now that the collection came out uh in a lonely place yeah you know like Valon court books I'm looking at right now it, I mean this just came out like a month like this month you know <laughs> and, yeah yeah uh, I, I remember pre-ordering that thing and my, my my copy showed up a few weeks ago and I'm you know, yeah re- I'm reading through it right now actually yeah I just finished uh in the pine from it which is an amazing story which uh, I think that's the one we're planning on covering next right <laughs> So maybe uh, yeah. Eldritch Tales can be uh, like the go-to Carl Edward Wagner uh, podcast now, you know, like in, on, on Soul Knox. <laughs> you know, yeah. how because like that's the, like you said, I can't find anyone talking about, about him, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, he, Wagner has written a lot of dark fantasy, he's written Conan stories, he published, he had a hand in publishing some of Conan, some of Robert e. Howard stuff, he's a horror yeah, writer, I mean, he- you know. So much stuff. He was a, he was um, one of the the main guys who kind of led the revival of the original Howard stories. You know, like yeah. a lot of people forget about that. Like he he was instrumental in in getting the original versions. You know, that weren't tampered by Spog de Camp and Carter. You know, uh, published again in the eighties. Um, and I I think a, a part of that was. Um, uh, like, you know, I just ordered recently, I, you know, I just read his book, his um, Conan novel, and then in particular his Grand McMorn novel, Legion from the Shadows, which is fucking amazing. And um, and uh, I guess this publisher, Bayon, is the name that, that released it's on the Shadows. I think um, uh, Wagner was like re- like working to release a lot of the uh, original Howard stories back in the '80s on this publisher. Yeah, which is where all the Delray editions ended up coming from, was from from that, you know. So it's pretty cool. Like, and um, I think that's what makes Wagner stuff like so like great is because um, it's like uh, you know, like uh, like In the Pines, for example, or Sticks. They both feel like real. I feel like really in the tradition of all the old weird fiction stuff because you could tell he's so like, you know, grounded in that. And then he's like modernizing at the same time in a lot of ways. You know, he's, he's bringing kind of a little bit of a modern touch. And I feel like he even did that with, say, the Conan novel or Bram McMorn or things like that, you know. And all of his stuff seems to be fucking dark, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, he's definitely a modern writer. Um, and you know, I think that they covered sticks on that show because, uh, you know, the, the true detective connection, you know, people like to say that that is, I mean, I mean, I imagine Pizzolatto definitely was influenced a little bit by that, but, uh, you know, that is almost like, um, relevant in a cultural way, in a modern cultural way. So that's the story I guess they picked, but man, like that collection, uh, in a lonely place has got a pretty good bandwidth of all of his material. I mean, it has like the classics, you know, like uh, Sticks, 
uh, River of Nights Dreaming, um, uh, when summer where summer ends, that's another great one. Uh, in the pines, yeah. and, and there's another. Uh, actually, I just finished reading this one today. Actually, there's there's a story in there that's almost like um, almost like a Stephen King story. I don't know if you've got to it yet. I haven't yet. Yeah, it's it's like a almost like a cross between Michael Shea and Stephen King because well. It doesn't have like a, a Cthulhu sort of vibe to it, like a mythos sort of vibe, but it has like a Stephen King vibe because it's like a very modern kind of like uh, story about like uh, a porno actress and revenge and this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. But uh, it was a very good story, but definitely not, in my opinion, not the strongest one in the collection. But man, where I I think I I want to talk about all the stories in there, either on on soul Knox or like you know on on uh long shadows or whatever you know i think it's yeah it's a really like pe- more people should know about this book is i guess what i'm trying to say yeah well that's the thing too like um you know we started in the pines and then uh uh you know mix in uh, like uh maybe not do all of them like in a row but like try to hit each one you know hit each story like uh even if we do, because I kind of want to do um, the Wendigo. Yes, by uh, Algernon Blackwood. Blackwood. Yeah, but yeah, like after that. But then swing back around, and do another Wagner story until we, until we finish all the stories in the book. Like I would be down for that because I, I definitely am a champion for Wagner. Like where I'm like just trying to get everybody to to read him because also a big part of it too for me is that um, I want people to buy this book and and uh, and read it and and. I want you know because I think if more people buy this book and there's like a demand for his work, it, the rest of it will get back in print too. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and the thing is, is uh, man, aside from his horror stuff, there's there's all the Kane material. There's three novels and then all the short stories, missed all the myriad of short stories that are only right now available as Kindle or for like super expensive, you know, hard hard versions of like you know tactile books you know what i mean yeah exactly like i will definitely that's another thing like i like i'd like to just like to see all this stuff go back in print because i mean like right now it's like um out of like the major uh horror weird fiction authors these one the ones that who is most most difficult to find you know what i mean like i mean it's kind of equi- I mean, with like Ligotti, even he has some some of his books that you can find pretty easy. You know, it, there's some that are like Nocturne and stuff that are harder to find, which are going to get reprinted soon. Um, but like with Wagner, nothing of his. It, and before this uh, this book came out, nothing of his had been in print since the '90s. I don't think. You know. Yeah, you're right. You know, and and like I said, just and I don't know if you've seen the the covers that they have on the Kindle versions of the. Kane Kane stories. <laughs> they're, they're, they're fucking they're terrible. Awful, they're so cheesy. Yeah, <laughs> it's like <laughs> it looks like some kind of like some of them look like these weird like romance novel covers or something. You know what I mean? Where <laughs> he's wearing a headband in one of them. I don't know. It's just really funny. Yeah, they're really bad. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I mean, they did those um, omnibus collections of Kane, like a two volume set that had everything um, that I've seen that goes for like three to five hundred dollars yeah, you know man. like yeah and uh yeah it's like um i love that to to get those like in a new edition it would be great if, if if somebody reissues them and then maybe maybe in the only place coming out as a, a step in the right direction for wagner getting reprinted you know like maybe maybe because maybe uh because i know he had two main story collections in his lifetime that's what it says in the ramsey campbell introduction and and um, I'm hoping maybe they'll re- they'll reissue the the second one as well with this first one, you know. Yeah, that'd be cool, you know. And and the other thing about Kane, the character, you know, it's like, man, it's perfect for either a comic book series or a movie, you know. Yeah, like one of those like uh, TV kind of shows that they're doing now, where it's like a miniseries. Yeah, I mean, with, if you think about everyone loved game of thrones you know the second uh you know the second thing they did was i only watched a few episodes of that one it kind of 
I lost my interest really in the whatever that new thing is that they were doing. And um, Kane is like a way more interesting character, I think, because he's he's a total antihero. You know, it's um, you know, he's immortal. You know, they they hint that he's actually Cain from Cain and Abel in the Bible, but then, yeah, but then he, uh, you know, he kind of dispatches that idea. He's like, well, you know, that that's not really what who I am, and he's you know he he has uh, magical abilities and he's also you know a swordsman, and um, there's like a whole like all of time is really. You can tell many stories. Like you can have all these different seasons that take place in different timelines because of he's immortal. You know. Yeah, well, I think um, he kind of, you know, he's in that same same mold as like Elric or, you know, when he's kind of dark antiheroes. And um, the thing that sucks is that yeah, like I've only the only thing from about Kane that that I've there's somebody did some. Um, readings of some of the short stories on YouTube. Yeah. Which I listen to. That's pretty much all I, I can I've I've um know of Kane, you know, and that those stories are amazing. I just wanted to read more, you know, it's like uh you know, I've been thinking like maybe I should just uh, try to order some of these paperbacks and stuff like you did. I don't know. Like <laughs> Yeah man, I have like from when I was a kid I had one the I had uh what the hell is it called? Um Death, uh, some there was three the three novels: Bloodstone, uh, Death Angel's Shadow. Death Angel's Shadow is the one that I had when I was a kid, and then subsequently I picked up uh, Bloodstone and the third novel um, of Cain, and then now the the short story collections I have just on Kindle. Right, and you have um. You have that with that one collection that came out in what was it the nineties or two thousands the Where the Summer Ends one? Yeah, that one. It's funny. I picked that one up. I, I definitely I dropped some some cash on that one. You know what I mean? Oh, Darkness Weaves. Yeah. That's the one. Darkness Weaves, Death Angel's Shadow, and Bloodstone. Those are the three novels. Okay, yeah, yeah. But the um, yeah, I was obsessed with reading all those stories, and I was like looking for like a cheap one or one that was like. You know, um, yeah, there's there's varying prices out there. You know, so I found one. I paid over a hundred bucks or whatever. You know, it was it was it was pricey. You know, what I mean, I, I don't want to say exactly how much I paid for it because it was kind of <laughs> like it's embarrassing. You know what I mean? But like, I had to have it, man. And the but the upside to that was the um, condition that was noted was fair. Okay. So I'm like, all right, you know, it's readable. Like, I don't, you know, maybe the cover might be fucked up or whatever. So I ordered it. The book that I got was a hardcover library book. Dude, it was like, it had the, you know, the the dust jacket on it. It had like the slip inside where, you know, whatever library it was at, you know. And, right. <laughs> and it was in like perfect condition, man. Nice. Like no one has ever read it or something at the library. <laughs> well, yeah, probably. You know, it's. I mean, if you think about, you know, it's not. It's not a household character. You know what I mean? And yeah, maybe no one has read it. You know, maybe people did sleep on it. But yeah, it, it's. It's definitely old. You know, but it, it looks like an artifact. You know, it's like an old library book, and I have it, and I'm like really excited. And that, and that's where I read um, a lot of those stories. Like like Sticks is in there. Um, you know, River of Night Dreaming is in there, and, you know, some of the other stuff. A lot of, I mean, and then, then you know, this year, <laughs> I pre-ordered a book that has <laughs> almost all the same stories in it. You know, that's... Right. But, hey. You didn't know that that was coming out? I didn't know. I had no idea that it, book so. was coming out when I bought when I bought that, you know? Yeah. So. Like, uh, I, I don't I think that the and only place wasn't announced until the end of last year, so... Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd already had that other book, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, so yeah, I was happy. I was like really excited when I found out about this uh, this this collection coming out. I think I I, I think it was funny because I was searching for Carl Edward Wagner books on uh, Amazon, and that's when I saw that, that it was going for a uh, pre-sale on this one. I was like, oh fuck! <laughs> I think either you or Rennie was the one, was someone who sent me the link to it cuz I wasn't even aware of it at first and it was either I think either you sent it to me or Rennie sent it to me I'm not sure Yeah I can't remember 
Yeah. But okay. that's uh, real, real, real excited about that. And, you know, like I said, hopefully the other stuff goes back in print. Yeah, hopefully. And, then, yeah, we're definitely, I mean, that's definitely something people can afford to do on Full Knox is, is uh, covering, like, you know, his stories. Like, definitely, like, over the little ne- next period of time, I want to try to cover all the stories in there and, and mix it in with um with other, with other other some other stuff, you know, like... um like uh, like the Wendigo, for example. Like I really want to like the Wendigo. I really want to cover because I've been. I don't know. You know, and sometimes you just think about something a lot. Yeah. And for some reason, like the Wendigo, the whole like myth of the Wendigo and skinwalkers and all kinds of stuff has been like really like on my mind recently for some reason. Yeah, and and in, like in in popular culture, I feel like like there's been Wendigo stuff, you know, out like there was that. Um that movie that came out a couple, like a year ago or whatever, Antlers or something, I think it was what it was called. And though it's not really about the Wendigo. It has, it's like based on that character a little bit on that folklore somewhat. Yeah, it didn't really take a, like a Wendigo too much to me. Like it didn't act like it so much, but it was a, yeah. I would say it's inspired yeah. by it. You know what I mean? It's not the actual Wendigo, but it was like someone had probably heard about it when they wrote the script for that, you know? Yeah. Like, when I imagine the Wendigo, I feel like it's, like, pretty hor- horrifying, like, uh, ravenous beast. You know, like, that's, like, a, like a spiritual thing, though, at the same time. Like, they have, like, this spiritual quality, like, uh, like where it's, like, a, yeah, it's a disembodied spirit, but it uh, kind of infests people, you know, drives them crazy. Did you ever see Ravenous, way. that movie Ravenous? I haven't seen that one, but I remember a while ago listening to Necromaniacs where you guys were talking about winter horror. I yeah. Think you brought that up. Yep. Ravenous is, uh, it's a, it's like, a, once again, another Wendigo-inspired story. It's a little bit closer to what the actual folklore is, though. And um, it came out a while ago, man. It's like an older movie. I think it came out in the late 90s, maybe. And, yeah, um, I think so. Guy Pierce is in it. It's like one of the early Guy Pierce roles. Yeah, I really need to check that out. I should go out to the to like just watch that. I mean, like, cause I well, it's probably it is definitely probably a good one to watch during the winter though. From that, like, and uh, get some of that Wendigo vibes going on. <laughs> yeah. Actually, like, yeah, it came out in 1999. This movie, Ravenous. Yeah, so it was like Guy Pierce just getting started. Like, I think that must have been right after LA Confidential. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably yeah. LA Confidential was a few years before that. Yeah, because I remember LA Confidential being like his like his first real big American movie. Yeah. So what's yeah. the story with uh with this 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 Doom project you're thinking about doing, man? You got you got underway. You're thinking about it. you've actually started recording some of this stuff. Doom. Oh, I, I, I don't have a Doom Pro. I have the Black Metal Project that I'm working on right now. Yeah, you sent me some stuff that was slow, though. Was that is that an older thing you were working on? Um, I remember which one I sent you. The uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, the other one. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Sleeping Pill. Yeah, yeah that's a uh, that is Doom as well. Sorry, I was kind of confused for a second. They um, yeah, Doom, Sleeping Pill, the one I sent you. That's like the newest thing I sent you, right? Yeah. Yeah, and um. But yeah, that one is um, a band that, that is, is primarily like my my friends, like kind of my friend and off, like baby in a lot of ways. Like, um, but it, we we kind of started it to share songwriting. So mm-hmm. uh, after our last band, like we wanted to kind of restart and um, refocus, like, and because the last band that we did. Um, I kind of wrote most of the songs, um, but I just was like the lead singer in it, you know? And so I'd kind of write the songs and he'd refine them and, and, and stuff like, and, um, and the, the, our old, our old band was probably a, a little bit more like some of my, like, um, that band, that one project I sent you, the Warlock project, like it was a little bit more in that vein, you right. know? Yeah. Um, but then, yeah. So then we we decided to refocus and and do something where we're both playing instruments and um, and everything. And so we started sleeping pill. Like this was a long time ago, but 
uh, for a while, um, I kind of was like not really writing so much. Uh, like, you know, I had like writer's block for a while and stuff. And that, that was part of the reason I wanted to start a band where we both wrote songs, you know, like, cause, cause then if one person's having writing block, then you're both, you know, the other person could write more or whatever, vice versa. And, um, but then it kind of ended up, the project ended up becoming more of an off like kind of baby, like where he writes, he's, he's written pretty much all the songs and, um, and everything, which is, it's fine. Like, cause I really like what he's come up with. And, um, it started off more of like, um, wholly different form where we are now, like kind of more, um, I don't know, like indie rock, alt, alternative, like in like rock, like, um, Punk mix mix oh, type of okay. thing like yeah. uh, kind of shoegaze shoegazy like all rock that's how it started like the first songs he was writing and then and then it kind of transformed um, really after we saw we went right before a pandemic we went and saw Cult of Luna live and like the show was like super crushing and I was doing this um, uh, thing with my my brother where we um did this kind of like semi improv thing called flood of blood, um, which was very into the kind of doom, like it was like mixture of doom and post rock type of type of sound, you yeah. know? Yeah. That, that's, um, those are two things that seem to go together for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if I ever sent you that we only did one live show, um, before the pandemic. And I, um, I don't know if I ever sent you that video off the send to nine, but we did kind of like this, um, semi improv piece that was like 20 minutes and, and it was kind of mixing, I guess like, um, uh, experimental noise stuff that he noise like instruments that he had. And then he was playing drums and I played guitar, did vocals. And, and it was very like those kind of things mixed together. Pretty cool. Like, I, and I remember showing that to an and everything and we were so cool. And that was kind of more, it, our sound kind of shifted for the sleeping pill. We started writing stuff more in that vein, you know, and so we had like the demo, which is like um, that he re- that Anoff recorded everything for and released. That which I think was um, about, uh, I forget the the name it was like Nuclear Winter or Prelude to Nuclear Winter is what it was, which you can find on Spotify and stuff. And um, I really really like that and I like the direction. So that's kind of the dire- that's where we're continuing to go um, and we're working on some new stuff right now. Um, and and. For this new album, it's a little. We were we have been working on some stuff together more, where it's a little bit more collaborative. And um, and uh, but that first song um, that we released that you can get on Spotify or anywhere. Um, that one I sent you. That one's like um, he wrote, but then I played the bass on it. Like and um, I I really like what he did with that. So you know the the whole whole vibe is yeah, it's definitely more that kind of mixture of. Doom, po- like a little bit post rock, a little bit post punk, you know, like, you know, whatever. Like, he's real influenced by, um, like, bands like Cold Luna and Sigur Rós and, um, and a lot of those kinds of things, you know? You know, I've never seen Cult of Luna, man. I, I've, that's a band that I've always wanted to check out. I mean, I, I, I know I have their records, I just have never seen them live. It is, it's, they're intense and, Particularly, like, when we went and saw it, it was, like, literally the last show, like, literally, like, I think, like, three or four days later, like, like, everything shut down. Oh, and, um, yeah, so, I think, I think it was the last date of their tour, and they, they probably just made it back to Sweden in time, you know what I mean? Um, everything shut down, and, and so we're going to this thing, and, you know, like, not, you could tell people, you could just see how that feeling like something bad was going to happen, like, you know, you just had a feeling, like, going to show like I don't think we knew that it was going to be like no shows and everything shut down right but you know there was just that feeling of like pandemic in the air like or whatever Dude, I, I, and uh, it's, you know what I mean and, I totally know what and, you then, mean. <laughs> and then going to see them and their music's already pretty heavy you know and pretty like dark and, and everything it was just a really intense kind of experience watching them live you know they got two drummers and Million guitar players, everything is just so fucking crushing. Yeah, I have to make a point of seeing them. And spe- speaking of like stuff as a result of the pandemic, it's like that. My thing with ne- ever since things started opening up like a year ago, my whole 
approach is like if there's something I want to see, I go see it. And like that's a band that's on my list of bands that I've never seen that when next opportunity, I'm just going to go and check it out. Like there's been a bunch of shows coming up recently that um, I just – there's still a little tiny part of me like, oh, I don't know, man. But then I'm just like, I push that part of, part of me aside. And I just go to get the tickets and go like, like, um, the brain bombs are playing in, in New York. And, um, I've never seen them. I've always wanted to see them. I don't th- know if they've ever, I think they played in Los Angeles once. Maybe I've never known them to play on the East coast. And as soon as I saw those, those tickets go up, I was like, or, or the announcement for the show. I was like, I got to get these tickets, man. And, and sure enough, I it went on sale Friday. I got my ticket. You know, I got tickets to go see Emperor. That one, that one, <laughs> the Emperor tickets hurt a little bit, man, because they were <laughs> fucking expensive, man. But, you know. I bet. I mean, this yeah. might be the last time I ever see Emperor, you know what I mean? Like, who knows if they're going to play again? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you probably – probably want to get a chance to see them live in the states again maybe if you go to like beyond the gates or something you know what i mean yeah like if you go to norway you could probably might get a chance to see them yeah in europe yeah definitely I, I, yeah i get festivals but like here in the states in brooklyn you know they're playing at the king's theater which is like a really cool venue actually i saw sigil roast play there um when they came to the states a number of years ago and um it's like this beautiful theater man it's and that would be the perfect setting to see emperor so that's that's on the list, you know. There's um, Clan of Zymox is playing. I'm gonna go see them. There's like, you know, just that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, they're it's, great live. Oh yeah, I've, I've heard, you know, and and yeah, if something comes up, I do it, you know. And that was my whole thing of going to Germany last year. I was talking to Ralph, you know, and like, it was this thing of like, man, it would be great if you can come out. And I'm like, fucking, I'm gonna come out. I just like got tickets and I went, you know, and it, and it was. It was great, you know, and I and that's the thing. It's like after the pandemic, man. After life changed again, you know, we had we got another another chance to to live. You know, I decided to fucking live instead of stay like inside. You know, right? Yeah, I think that's important. You know, like to get to get out and do stuff when you can. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and definitely recommend. If you had a chance to see Cold, Cold Women Alive, because, um, yeah, they're fucking really great live. And, like, the vibe, you know, it's just a, such a heavy vibe. And, you know, it's the kind of thing, like, certain kind of bands like that, like Neurosis or Cold Luna or something, they're just, like, there's just, like, extra heaviness. And, like, I really um, I like that. I like that feeling when you go to a show and you feel like, like here it's like like um transformative experience just like watching the band live or something you know and like going to see the swans or band like that like that's always something that i really like when i go see live is something that's intense you know in that way yeah no i 100 percent, man you know it's funny uh there was some weird youtube ad that i, I it caught my interest for like a second and i ended up watching this ad and it was this guy I don't even remember his name, but you can tell just by his looking at his face that he was like dishonest and full of shit. You know what I mean? And he's like, <laughs> yeah. he, op- he opened up his old infomercial with, do you remember what life was like before the pandemic? And I was like, Oh, interesting. And he's like, yeah, it's like late thirties, early forties guy, you know, rugged, you know, he's like a, talking about his being on his surfboard and living in Mexico and stuff like that. Like kind of West coast looking dude. You know what I mean? Yeah, tan, you know, healthy guy, you know, um, probably swings kettlebells around and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like one of yeah. these guys. Like, uh, and I was like, man, this guy is so full of shit. But then I kind of, yeah, of course, he was trying to sell a book, and he's one of these like lifestyle dudes, you know, where it's like, you know, I figured out a way to make a million dollars, and I have my own company, you know, but all before I was thirty, and you know, all this bullshit, you know what I mean? And you know that it's some weird, you know, pyramid marketing scheme or some shit that he's trying to sell you you know but yeah yeah. but what i did think about though was like definitely remembering life before and after this whole thing man and like i try to push it down and be like ah no everything's the same man it's cool everything's good it's fucking different now isn't it don't you think do you feel that yeah i think so in a lot of ways i mean um i feel like uh 
I feel like there's definitely, in a lot of ways, it's the same, you know, but then there's also a different, different feeling. I do think that people are, uh, it's like a little bit of kind of that, uh, like, I don't know. I mean, I guess for me, the thing was, is that aside from not going to shows, uh, my life really was, I mean, the work, work jobs I was working, I mean, I just worked through, through the whole thing, was out and about during the whole pandemic. Like, I never had that whole part that a lot of people had where it's like suddenly you're stuck at home and stuff, you mm-hmm. know? Right. Um, so, so it was a little, you know, it had an impact on me to a certain degree, but not as much as, as some people, you know, like I didn't, I wasn't like suddenly like my whole life was different. I was staying at home all day. Like, you know, really the big thing that, that changed was not being able to go to shows and do things that, that I usually do, you know, in that way. But I do feel like, um, at the same time, I feel like, uh, I feel like the whole experience, I mean, probably has to change people to a certain extent uh, after dealing with that. You know what I mean? Like, particularly for people who did end up, ha- you know, having to stay at home, like everything changed. Like, yeah, on, the hope is that it changed for the better because you're spending more time with yourself or whatever you know what i mean like that's always a hope that that it's like a positive change but in some aspects i think it's a negative change because of the way that people kind of transitioned with like um the way they interact with each other and stuff of you know because of social media but yeah well people lost uh, their minds man during that period yeah people were not equipped to do this kind of thing and they fucking lashed out and of course Social media is like the perfect vehicle for for that sort of behavior, you know what I mean? And then just it propagated like another virus, you know, like another pandemic of poisonous thoughts started propagating through the rest of the, you know, the population, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I definitely feel like particularly at the end of 2020 into 2021, there was like uh, most definitely like a kind of... um, psychosis and sorts of people you know what i mean like and and i think it is that you know i tried to kind of I, I insulate myself somewhat from as much as i could but even for myself like i could feel that and the frustration and stuff with with like everything and with all the restrictions and all you know definitely build up with people you know yeah some people don't didn't deal with it very well and some people dealt with it better um you know i definitely think that the, that's where there's going to be lasting repercussions. I definitely feel like um, a lot of things aren't the same in the sense that, like, in a direct way, where, like, say, prices for everything and a lot of aspects of our day-to-day life um, are a lot worse now than they were before, you 100%, know? 100%, man. Absolutely, they are. Yeah. Like, like um, you know, everything's gone up so much, like, uh, in prices and... Uh, it's very like, which is a, a very frustrating side by, byproduct of it, and you know that's obviously changing thing change change. You know, so I definitely think life's harder now than it was before the pandemic. You know, there was a point during the pandemic because I, I my life was very different. You know, for well, first of all, I moved away from Brooklyn and out to out here. Like I'd been planning to do it. It wasn't like I I you know I, I evacuated the city, but it was like I had already made plans. And I had a very definite idea what my life was going to be like to move. And then the pandemic happened and I'm like, oh shit, man, am I going to be able to move? And sure enough, I was able to, you know, get a, get some, get a vehicle and all that stuff together and get, get the hell out and move into my new place. But then I'm in like this completely different universe, you know? And yeah, it was like a year before I was even able to like, feel like I actually lived here, you know what I mean? Because there was literally nothing to do. It was like everything was shut down, everything was dark, you couldn't leave your house, I was working remotely, you know, and everything was turned upside down, really. You know, and I think for that, I, I think I handled that aspect of it of, of it okay, you know. But then, like, some, th- if that was bad enough, other things happened in my life to turn, plunge me into, like, complete, fucking darkness and at that point i was like man i'm like waking up one day you know and i usually get up before the sun rises like i get up like at five every morning five five thirty ish and 
I woke up and I was just like, man, I think I died. I think like I'm in some weird liminal bardo like space between, you know, this is what that space is like between life, your death, like your past life and like some reincarnated state, you know? And, uh, I, I really felt that for like that I was going through some weird transitional phase, you know? And I guess in some ways I, I, we all are, you know, in a weird way, but yeah, in the grips of this whole thing, that's how it felt, you know? And, and honestly, it's, it's funny. All, this, this guy, this, this fucking fool trying to sell pyramid marketing plans made me think of all this stuff just the other day. That's why I'm talking about it now. And I was just like, yeah, I remember right. that, you know? And, um, yeah, it, it definitely, the, right before we left, I, that, when you were talking about how things were like, okay, something bad's going to happen. I remember driving down, I was still living in Brooklyn, I was driving to band practice, I was like a Friday night, and uh, I was driving down to New Jersey to, to uh, Keyport, and I was thinking like, like, ah, oh, there's, there's not, there's no traffic right now, you know, and I was just like, is it because people are staying home and you know, I was trying to like not get too freaked out about everything. And then, you know, we were down, we went, we did band practice. And at that point we were supposed to, our new, the EP was Monarchy of Shadows was coming out or had already had just come out. We played one show and it was like a record release show. Uh, we were gearing up to go on tour at Napalm Death and everyone was stoked. And I remember that night, at band practice afterward, it was Friday, so everyone, you know, we're just everyone's ready for the weekend. We went out to eat at this Mexican restaurant. Everyone was really excited. Everyone was happy and good spirits and everything. And then, like, the following week, like everything got canceled, man. <laughs> it was just yeah. like, it, I, f- I feel yeah. like that moment has been the way life has felt for like the last two and a half, almost three years. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, it's been it, it, elongated into like you know three years, you know. Right. Yeah, it's funny. Like, um, I remember the day I went to Clan of Zion, uh, Clan of Clan of Clan of Luna, called a Luna. <laughs> oh my God, Clan of Luna. I was trying to mix the two names together. Silver Mount Zion um, and Cult of Luna. <laughs> yeah, I was like trying to combine Clan of Zion and Cult of Luna together. Oh, right. um, yeah. Call, so the day I went to Cult of Luna, it was so funny because. I honestly was like, you know, I heard some like reports of this co- of COVID or whatever. Like, didn't really pay a lot of attention to it, for, to be honest. Like, I was hearing some stuff or whatever, and then, um, but it was just like not. I don't know. Like, one of my friends was like, "Oh, that's pretty." I told him I was going to show. He's like, "Oh, that's pretty brave." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "Oh, the like the virus or whatever." I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, like, totally. I was like, no fear at all. Like, cause it's like I don't care. Went to the show. I was just like, I was honestly just kind of like, like, I was like, what, like, why are you so afraid? You know? And that was always my perspective on it was like, I was out in it the entire time doing people working, you know, everything. Um, and, um, you know, really had no problems, you know what I mean? And I really was kind of like, felt like I kind of had a lot of frustration with, with, um, the fear, like, I like got the time I was working at a grocery store. It was like a natural grocery store, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah. um, it was very um, annoying, like, feeling of all, everybody, like, freaking out and all this fear and stuff people were having, how they were buying everything and stuff. I was, like, more, like, frustrated with people because I thought it was stupid, you know? Like, because it was, like, the guy, like, grocery stores are going to be open. And I was, like, it's, even at that time, I was, like, this is, it's, yeah, it's not, it's obviously even at the very beginning of the reports about it, I was like, most of the people who have to fear from this are like old people and people have health problems. Like as far as I can tell the rest of us, you know, it's going to suck maybe if you get it, but not like going to kill you. You know what I mean? And I was also like, it's, like I would be more, I would be afraid if it was like, uh, I don't know, like Ebola going rampant where you're, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, if it was like, Ebola, but, we'd have a bigger problem for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, then it would be like the Black Death or something. Yeah. Like with this was like I felt like um most of the problems for this one were man man created, man made, you know, like the disease itself I don't think I mean personally I don't think it would have um I mean we've had far worse things come out like um 
pig flu and all those kinds of stuff, like other other viruses in the past, you know, swine flu or whatever, you know, like that, that were actually a lot worse than COVID. Um, and nothing shut down. You know what I mean? Like um, everything kind of kept running. So I felt like a lot of everything shutting down was primarily the um, result of fear mongering of the public, like being afraid. You know what I mean? Like they, it was almost like the public were demanding them to shut everything down because they were so afraid. And I was just kind of like, how like I don't know, even like a kind of contempt for it for it for that because I was like, um, so people are so fucking afraid of of kinds of stuff and I'm like I just feel like that in of itself is more damaging than the disease sometimes you know what I mean like the fear that they have you know yeah well once once it got like politicized you know I think that's when everyone's identity was wrapped up in into how how they handled COVID you know it's like if you're like yeah. some John Wayne like right wing cowboy you don't care about wearing a mask and you don't give a fuck about anybody but if and if you're like you know liberal conservative uh liberal progressive person then you're supposed to be afraid and you know have masked five masks on and clean your hands obsessively yeah, and, and that sort of stuff you know yeah and you know like dehumanize people who don't want to get the vaccine and stuff. you know what i mean like it was yeah. and it was that way on both sides it was like yeah if you stupid, wanted to get you know, the, if you wanted to get vac- vaccinated you're a pussy by the conserv the conservatives, that was their take on it. And then if you didn't want to get a vaccine, you were like some Nazi, like racist, you know, uh, you know, right wing like zealot, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was it was weird. I know I was just like I found that really annoying because I was like, uh, you know, some people just have some uh, reservations about this about this vaccine. You know, like they're saying, oh, it's it's safe, it's okay, because whatever. I was like, I don't I don't think so. Like you know, I I prefer. I don't know, I think it's going to be that safe, but yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's you know, there's whatever's going on now. Like, um, but like, I feel like um, I just found, I found it frustrating because when it comes to things like that, the last thing you need is for it to be politicized. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, uh, and the and of course the media was politicized was driving that politicization, and I was, you know, this whole. That was what was like getting to me most about the whole that whole period was just getting so like frustrated with with how stupid everybody was on every side. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. I mean that that exacerbated everything. I think that it hadn't been if it had it not been for all that right right wing versus left wing stuff, this thing would have been wrapped up a lot easier. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. But then again, what I the think, fuck do uh, I know? I don't fucking know anything about what I'm talking about, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, I think that's, I don't know, I feel like that's definitely the truth. Like, you know, I think if it hadn't gotten politicized, it would have been a lot, a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, I just was like, it was, a, it was a weird vibe, though. Like, uh, I remember first time I went to the grocery store and, like, the aisles are empty. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like what is going on? Like, I felt like people thought that they weren't going to be able to go to the grocery store. And then what ended up happening was that you were, grocery stores weren't closing. You know what I mean? Like you didn't have to like go and buy everything like that. You know what I mean? Like hoard everything, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It was unnecessary. And I I think a lot of people realized, and it was funny working at a grocery store during it is that people got so freaked out and bought all this shit. And then some of the people like, realize their their error like they realize that oh fuck like i bought too much stuff that i don't need <laughs> and uh and everything in the groceries aren't closing people aren't dying in the streets or anything i and they feel like coming back and like trying to return stuff <laughs> oh man really they're trying to return things huh yeah trying to get excited to come back and return and, like all stuff so i like, yeah it was so funny like uh, how people were. I mean, I just don't understand. Like, like for example, like, why do you need to buy like a million eggs? You know, how are you going to eat all those eggs? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, totally, man. I mean, one of the things that I did. I mean, I, and this wasn't even as part of the pandemic. I was thinking more of like in case because out here in Jersey we get floods sometimes and like the power goes out and everything. And yeah. I think as a result of the uh, the thing that happened down in Texas, I did stockpile some canned goods. 
That's what I have. Yeah. And I got some canned goods. I got some rice. You know, I don't really eat rice on a daily basis. And I have some uh, dehydrated meals, you know, just in case shit yeah, does I, get crazy. And that's about it. I, I think it's always good to have some stuff, like, stockpiled, you know what I mean? Just in case, like, yeah. you know, like, you could have a crazy storm. You could have any kind of emergency. It's good to have be prepared for emergency, but uh, maybe not to the uh, crazy extent some people did. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm a, you, we haven't really talked about Skinner Marink, and since we had the Necromaniacs episode about it, did you uh, you've seen that right? What, what do you think of that movie? I haven't got gotten on watching it because I had to watch um, The Exorcist and everything. Ah, okay. So yeah, because I've been I you know I have a limited amount of time to watch stuff, so I was like uh, getting prepared for that, uh, the podcast episodes that did about The Exorcist, and I'm preparing for another thing I'm going to do with Ralph. So I have to like swing back around and watch Skinner Marink fully. I, I saw mean, it in the. Th- I watched the the short and everything, but oh heck, yeah, 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 yeah. It's um, yeah, I saw it in a movie theater, man. Which is I I had this whole night planned out for myself, and it's like I have this thing. It's like on Friday nights, if there's a movie that's out that I have to see that I want to see, I do it Friday night at ten o'clock. It's the last show. I live like really close to an one of those AMC theaters with the recliners and all that stuff and um no one goes to that showing it's always the not the one before that one whatever the whatever the movie is it's always jam-packed with people and then the late the last one is always empty so i always go to the last one of the night and that's how i checked out skin and marine i mean there was only there was me another person and a couple and the couple bailed like you know not even halfway through the thing and then as I was leaving, right. the other guy was completely asleep, like, in his seat. Like, when I was leaving, the dude was, like, unconscious. <laughs> like, it is, it is – because you can – those reclining seats, they you can make it almost flat, man. Like, you're laying down. Yeah. <laughs> so this dude was, like, completely asleep, man, just, like, unconscious, like, laying there. And I walked by him, like, I'm going to have to rouse this guy, man, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to watching it just to have to like, find the time like once I, cause I finish watching some stuff. Like, the, um, so it's definitely high on my list. I mean, I really like that, that short. And, um, you know, I'm the more I hear about Skin Ring, the more excited I'm to watch it. It's just finding a time also because it's like a very long movie. Yeah, it's like, that's the thing, man. These days, movies are like a, one hour, like 100 minutes long, like every every single movie. You know, yeah, they're getting longer and longer, yeah. man. It's like everything's like like hour forty minutes. Yeah, because that one's like two hours, isn't it? Yeah, that one is like 40. yeah, that one's like got to be like two hours at least. But I, I I know that in the last grip of films that I've seen, like the all, the newer ones that have come out, they're all like a hundred minutes long. They're like another ten minutes at least. You know, and, and you know, Terrifier two was like over two hours. You know. Yeah, I've, I've noticed a lot of movies been like over two hours. My problem is with that with my work, the time I get home, get settled and everything, you know, I have a, a period of time where I can watch something and then go to bed. But it's like, uh, it's like, I have to, if I have to like, if I want to watch something longer like that, I have to like, uh, make sure I like, you know, get it, get, get it started on time or I'll have to like, sometimes I'll watch them in two goes, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but, there's some movies I prefer to watch a movie from start to finish. The, the, um, you definitely should try to watch Skin and Rank in one one setting, like one, all the lights out by yourself, just like focused on it because um, it takes a lot of patience to get through it. Yeah, I was planning on uh, watching it like that, like, and I want I want to watch it how I watch Seder, where because I, I watched that one on my computer and had my headphones plugged in. Yeah. Like in the dark with my headphones, and that was like a perfect way to watch Seder because, like, he kind of had that more three dimensional sound with like the way that the like and watching Seder, like, man, that movie fucking made me jump. Yes, in a couple parts of it. <laughs> Definitely, man. I, you know, I'm about due for a rewatch of that movie. I love that movie. Yeah, I, I want to. Well, particularly because I've been like on this, like, been on this vibe of like. um Woods horror type of thing, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, like, I was like, 
think about Saber Row every time. I was like, I need to rewatch that because I, I fucking love that movie. I feel like that was like that's that style of of film, and obviously that's more, way more like coherent than any of these other films that you know. Because there's there's like the Outwaters came out too, which I, I watched that on Friday at home. It's on uh, Screenbox. And that's like taking a cue from this whole thing of like super abstract storytelling, you know, like kind of yeah. everything obscure and you can't really see certain things like that sort of stuff. But I feel like Seder, as far as on the big screen, is my, maybe the beginning of that kind of thing, you know, that's like taking that experiment, experimental approach to a, to a big screen. And, and, before I go any further, there I know there's like a huge scene which I learned about recently called analog horror, which is mainly like just a bunch of YouTube channels and stuff. That there, there, there's a something else that came out in 2021 that's called um, the Mandela Catalog, which you know is is a, I would say a contemporary to Skinnamarink, except that it's it's a uh, multiple episodes strung together to make a story, but it's like. It's not. It's not the same, but some of the um, that deep seated fear that originates in your childhood in like your deep your deep subconscious, I feel like is part of what Man- the Mandela catalog is mining, as well as what Skinnerink is doing. And, yeah, um, and I, I feel like there's a lot that's going to be this thing. I think moving forward to varying degrees of success. success. Like some's not going to succeed. Some's going to be. This is just going to be like another tendril of storytelling. I think that's going to start being manifested, which I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, I feel like a lot of these uh, filmmakers guys like they seem to be like my age or a little bit younger. Yeah, so, you know, like where they're like in the 30s. You know, they grew up in the 90s, late yep. 80s. You know what I mean? Like like how it is, and because like the Skinner rinks, I think like set like in 95 or something, and. The toys are like are all like from from that time period. I know, like in the movie and in the the, the the short as well. You know, like and uh, I think that's cool. Like I guess I can relate to that. You know, like because it's kind of your childhood, like childhood. And I feel like a lot of these guys seem to be in that kind of generation. You know. Yeah, definitely, and and it's um I find it ironic that that they call it uh, analog horror. You know, because uh, it is all on, like, the internet, you know, which is, like, by <laughs> by definition, digital. But, you know, like that uh, Kyle, uh, Kyle Ed, the guy's name is Kyle Edward Wagner, I believe, the dude who uh, who made Skin of Marink. <laughs> is that interesting? <laughs> That's <is> funny, yeah. <laughs> Just one name different. <laughs> yeah, one name different. He, um, you know... What what he's he's the same age, you know, he's like a, a younger guy, you know, only you know compared to me, he's a younger guy. <laughs> um, grew up in the nineties. Uh, the guy who did um, the Mandela catalog is a similar age. He might be just a little bit uh, younger than him. Kyle Edward Hall. I'm sorry, that's not. I, I want to make sure I got Kyle Edward Ball. Kyle Edward. Okay, Ball. Yeah. that's the guy's name. But um, well, yeah, so. Okay. So they're referencing like the actual equipment used to capture the image. You know, that's why like this other guy, I think his last name is Kister that makes um made the the Mandela catalog. They're filming on this like archaic video equipment, you know, stuff like uh, you know, like handheld video cassettes. Yeah, like video mini DV and cassettes and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's like think... the the capture medium is is analog, you know. Yeah. I think um, it's funny when I was a kid, I had I, I had that I was, like, obsession with like I wanted to make movies and stuff like when I was a kid, and so my I got like a, a, a straight up v, VHS like recorder, yeah. you know, like mm-hmm. like like one ones you you hold and it has a full VHS that you put into it and record on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I've seen those. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're like the big like VHS cam- camcorders. I had one of those, and I used that a lot. And then I got a um, a, a smaller um, digital cassette one. You know, like mini. I, I forget the name of that. Like that that format. Like the the smaller like digital 
uh, tape, you know? Yeah, no, I've seen, actually, I have one, right? I'm looking at one right now on my desk. It's a, uh, it's a, someone recorded like a, one of our shows on this thing, like 15 years or whatever, not 15 years ago, like 12, 13 years ago. Yeah, I, ha- I still have that camcorder, actually. I think it still works. I used it to record some like uh, music videos and stuff that I still record, you know, in the 2000s. And like, I had to like, uh, man, you know, record everything into a computer to do the editing and everything like like you know yeah you, ca- you capture it on the cassette but then you got to bounce it into the computer to edit you know yeah we had to use like a firewire cable back <laughs> oh, when geez. those existed <laughs> damn man now yeah now we're talking man. firewire jeez yeah like that's like a that's like a uh, dead medium right there but you have to use like, the thing that sucks with some of those old camcorders is that uh some of them how does they have they are set up for firewire. Although um, that one also you can also do stuff where you have an RCA out, so you could run an RCA yeah. out into like some type of converter or like thing, interface. I would imagine. Yeah, and it would be like yeah. you have, you'd have to bounce it in real time. You know what I mean? Yeah, you have to bounce it in time in real time. Yeah, and so yeah, the way I did like some of the, like the music videos for that for that, I did them like in order. So it made my life easier for like video editing, so I didn't have to like. I just did like the try to record everything like in order, like of, of um, the song, like what was going to come first, you know. <laughs> That's something so, I've like, never been able to motivate myself to do is do any kind of video editing, man. It's like audio stuff I'm pretty good at, you know, like any of the tools you have for making music and editing sound. I'm pretty decent at that, but like as far as um editing or shooting or color correction or any of that kind of stuff, man. I just like, I can't, I just, I don't know. It's just like one, one bridge too far for me, I guess. Yeah. I, I kind of, I have very limited amounts of experience with, um, with doing the video stuff. Like I, I enjoyed it. Like, um, particularly like, yeah, like, uh, one of the videos I did was like black and white, and I kind of made it look all like contrasted, kind of like uh, begotten or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, I think that the thing with with doing uh, video editing for myself was that I just like don't have no enough people and stuff to like really put together like a uh, you know make a movie or something that I felt like would be good. You know what I mean? Like I never crossed that that Rubicon to to that. You know, like. I do really like how um, these analog horror thing, like they were doing what they're doing with very limited amounts of people, you know, or limited, you know, like almost no people really, you know, I think that's really cool. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like a whole movement, man. And it's like, it, I've, in my, in my mind, like the analog horror and like creepypasta and all that stuff is kind of related, you know, it's like these short one and a half page stories that people would write, you know, that's like, you know, sort of creator, uh, like almost like fan fiction, you know, and that's kind of how a lot of this stuff kind of felt like it started. But yeah, I, yeah. That so far, those are the only two creators I know about is Ball and this guy Kister who's doing uh, Mandela Catalog. Or I, I think he's still working on it, actually. Uh, just literally, just within the last couple of weeks, found out about it. Yeah, I think, um, I definitely agree with you. That's That's what I think, too, is that a lot of it, Feels very in line with like creepy pasta, and then of course I'm thinking of of course of like Channel Zero, you know, oh, like man. that first season. Yeah. Loved it, loved it. That was so good. Yeah, like uh, not too long ago, I watched that first season of Channel Zero. I haven't delved further into it yet, but I really liked that first season a lot. Yeah, that was that was really I, I enjoyed that one a lot. The um, and, that brings us to. <laughs> What I recently saw is the Outwaters, man, which was like the new metal version of all this stuff. It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, I, I like to use that term, man, to describe things that are just like a collection of tropes. You know, that's not there's the filmmakers or the creator doesn't have any anything to say, really. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, that's kind of like what I mean. Uh, you know, I, I don't I, I, the move. I just I just dis, dislike that movie so much that. I don't think we're we're going to even talk about it on Necro. I don't know. Maybe we will, but it was um, very bad, 
It was like devoid of any kind of content. It was uh, the characters were horrible. Like I, you know, they were like I couldn't wait for them to get killed. Actually, most of the characters, and um, it just there was nothing to it, man. There was and like coming off a of Skinnerink, where there's so much going on like internally and you think about it and it stays with you like this film was you know it was a found quote-unquote found footage film so it already has that sort of feel to it of like you know documentary you know footage or something like that and then there's um you know parts of it where you can't see anything and darkness and like one light is shining and and that and that's the part that reminded me of like what the, what Ball was doing in Skin of a Rink, where that you would be staring into darkness for like you know minutes. It seemed like, you know, and this film right, would do the but... same thing, but with no, you, you weren't. It wasn't activating any of the synapses in your brain at all. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't cre- generating any any emotion. You know, I think I think part of that too, like with like Skin of a Rink, like. I mean, I haven't watched the full movie, but judging this just based off of watching the short, it's like static shots, yeah. and you're like sitting there expecting something to happen, or you know, you're trying to figure out what's going on. It kind of activates this part of your brain. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, man. It's like, like there were those moments in the film where where there's through through like video distortion, and there's all these like artifacts on in the in the screen in the visual part part of it where your brain starts assembling stuff and you start, you know, it's like if you stare at a point on a wall for too long, you start seeing things, you know? Yeah. Now, and that That's actually funny. Like one thing I thought about watching heck was, um, uh, when I was a kid and I mean, sometimes I do this as an adult as well. Um, and maybe not as much, but I used to do this thing where, um, uh, you know, it, Go to you know you, they make kids parents make you go to bed even though you're not really very sleepy and you so say you're lying there in bed in the dark and like staring at the wall I used to stare the ceiling in my old apartment where I lived with my dad was like that kind of popcorn ceiling yeah you know mm-hmm. yep and I just stare at this popcorn ceiling and like start like creating you start like seeing like faces in it and sure. You know, or the same thing with like the wall or something, like the drywall, you know, and you start seeing those faces and you start like figuring in the dark and you're getting that kind of like, um, I like kind of static, like looking at it and, uh, you know, you see faces. I felt like that's what the, the heck reminded me of sometimes was, uh, those moments when you're a kid and you're lying in bed, like just staring at the ceiling or wall or something, trying to go to sleep, you know, like, and you're like, making faces in it and stuff, you know? Yeah, that's a big part of it, you know? And and a lot of it is just the vulnerability of being so helpless when you're a kid. You know, it brings back those feelings of just helplessness and how much you depend on your parents and, you know, grown-ups and you're, you're really vulnerable, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, like afraid, yeah, like... Like, uh, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and your parents are at home or something, you know, like, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like, uh, I remember one time when I was a little kid, I was after my parents divorced. So it was like, I was, you know, with my dad in our apartment and, um, I was asleep and I remember waking up and come out and my dad wasn't there and I like freaked out, you know what I mean? Turned out he just like went out to go to the, like the, the convenience store, you know what I mean? Like down yeah. the street. He figured I was asleep, like it'd be okay. <laughs> I was like freaking out when he got back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Like, when I you're... thought he had like left me alone, like forever or something, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, something's just different, you know. And like at that age, I I was never alone when I was like, you know, the, the age of these kids in this movie, like they were like five or six or something like that. I was never alone. I was always had someone, an adult with me, really. Yeah, I I had a lot of times because it was you know my dad had to. Um, primarily do about you know like, it was either with my dad by myself or was by myself with my dad or by you know my mom like when I was with her and I was always like uh, I had a, like a lot of time alone you know into ha- at at um 
at home, you know, alone by myself, like, as a little kid. So I kind of got used to that. You know what I mean? Like, being alone. Like, uh, my dad would, like, leave in the morning. Like, like when I was in preschool, I had to only go for half a day because it was too expensive for him to do a whole day. So it would be, like, he would work in the morning and then come back for lunch and take me to the school preschool or whatever, and i spend the, you know, the rest of the day there. You know what I mean? So I'd be, like, home alone, like, half the days or days of work. I'd be home alone all day by myself if I was, like, during the summer or something. So kind of got used to being alone myself, but but it's, it's more like that kind of thing where, like, you're lonely, you don't, you don't realize you're going to be alone. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's you don't like, expect it. Scary. You're not prepared yeah. for it. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, for for me though, it's like I had all like my whole extended family around me when I was a little kid. I had like a grandmother, a great grandmother, all these aunts, uncles, all these people were like lived in the same town as me and uh cousins, you know, and, and like whenever my parents went anywhere, they would leave me in the care of one of my relatives. You know, they would either come over to the house or they would leave me at their house and so that and I guess that's like the thing watching that film like that really resonated with me about being, you know, brought me back to being that age, you know? And I was like, man, what, what would I have done if I was five and I was in this dark house by myself and everyone's gone and the windows are disappearing and all this other stuff, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the thing that I was like, creeped out with that, um, the heck short was, it felt like almost like, you know, the mother had died, like, in her room or something, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And the kid was just on his own, like, trying to, like, yeah. like didn't know what to do, you know? And, and that's a kind of scary thought. I mean, and that can happen, like, um, like one of my friends works with um, troubled kids, like, he's, like, a teacher. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, some of these kids, like, their parents are fucking drug addicts or whatever and die, you know what I mean? And it was kids are on their own, you know what I mean? And you just imagine being a six-year-old kid or something, your parent dies and you don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, like you're on your own and nobody's coming, nobody's coming to check in on you, you know, for at least for a little while. At some point, I hope this guy starts giving like, I mean, I, I understand why he doesn't want to, you know, talk too much about the movie or what it's about or give you any personal information or any insights into it because, you know, at this juncture, I can see not doing that, but maybe hopefully, hopefully next year, like I'd like to see an extended maybe maybe when the Blu-ray of this comes out, there's like some interview with him about the making of it and the kind of things he was trying to say and how much that lines up with um you know, with what other people are saying or what I thought about it. Like I know that my analysis of it is completely I have a like what I said on the podcast on Necro was like completely different than the way I feel about it now actually. No really. Like like your your kind of thought of it change changes yeah. like Yep. My my thoughts on it changed, you know, and and will probably continue to change, you know. I'll probably, eventually, I'll watch it again, you know, some time, yeah, you know, and then uh, the um the um I I, I think that it's like maybe he'll follow the kind of Lynch direction where Lynch like refuses to talk about it in movies, you know, you yeah. never know, like like I I um. My friend just got up for it because today's my birthday, you know, and my friend got me the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Fire Walk With Me, Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. Birthday, yeah, that's a cool. great, great movie. Yeah. And new Criterion one, oh, yeah. so I'm happy to have that now. I like, I love that movie. And that, you know, like Lynch, Lynch is not quite as abstract as, as like, what this guy's movies are, but... <laughs> I know it's weird because I remember when Lynch was like in, in his heyday, you know, when, especially when, um, well, I guess starting with, uh, the lost highway and then with Mulholland drive and then inland empire, inland empire is probably closer to what's, what, uh, what this guy's doing with skin and rink. You know what I mean? But yeah, uh, inland empire is real crazy. Yeah. yeah coming it's, out in, um, as well. And like, and the, next month or something oh really I I, i'd like to pick that up i like to pick up a criterion of that like or something like that you know blu-ray i yeah. have it on dvd but it doesn't have much extra stuff with it yeah it's coming out on the criterion um blu-ray yeah because before with inland empire cause i never ended up buying it 
Um, and I, yeah, I had rented it from Netflix back in the day, like, you know, when you could rent DVDs. Right. That's how I saw it the first time. Um, and I was trying, I was thinking about buying it on DVD, but then I wanted to get the deluxe edition. I wanted to get the, the two disc version that has like the rabbits like thing and like all this extra, extra stuff. Yeah. And, um, and it goes, it's pretty pricey now. It's like 50 bucks for this Blu-ray, this DVD. And then, then I was like, well, they're re-releasing all the the movies on Criterion, so I'm going to wait and see if they release it on Criterion. And sure enough, like, they, I saw they announced the, that's coming out here in a couple months. So, do you, do you think Lynch has got another film in him somewhere? Do you think you think he's going to have another movie out for us at some point? I think he'll release. I think he'll do at least one more. Yeah, I'd like. I, mean, to I don't so. know. I like to think so. Yeah, he has another, at least one more movie. I think at least one more. I'd like to see more than that, obviously. Yeah. But um, I, yeah. I mean, no one expected Cronenberg to release a new movie, and he did the last year. So. Also, I feel like Lynch is is like kind of timeless. You know what I mean? Like his point of view is a timeless point of view. You know what I'm yeah, trying to say? Put, yeah, and his work is kind of timeless in a way. Like where, I mean, all of his movies. Like, like, you, like, say, like, Blue Velvet, for example, filmed in the 80s, but, like, the themes of it, I don't know if it's set in the 80s, or it almost seems like it might be set before that. It seems like it's not set in any time, you yeah. know, like, it's set in this kind of, like, because uh, people are kind of dressed in the 80s, but they're also dressed in the 50s, and, you know, like, it has this kind of weird, like, no time type of feeling, you know what I mean? I think that's consistent through all of his work, really. I mean, all the different eras of films, you know, maybe with the exception of Wild at Heart, which is, um, you know, it's an adaptation of a novel. But, you know, if you take that out of the mix, you know, like uh, Blue Velvet, uh, you know, uh, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, all those films, it's like there's elements of everything. Like, there's the, like some of the characters look like greasers you know what i mean they have like this 50s like kind of sensibility yeah but then like the music's modern and then you'll there'll be some modern dressed people but then even some of their dialogue is like from the 50s too you know yeah and well again last yeah last highway he has you know it's like a very noir type of feeling like it you know in, in so many ways like almost like two different noir movies put in one because like, the first one's like real dark like 1930s like uh, noir like with all the shadows and everything right. kind of and then the second half has this kind of like gangster low life like type of feeling to it that's like a little bit more 50s noir you know what I mean like sure. but then it's all in the 90s of 90s music but it feels like this kind of timeless like themes in it you know yeah, the music is great, man. It's um, yeah, you got Rammstein. You got the, my favorite track though on that soundtrack is the uh, the Lou Reed cover of "This Magic Moment." It's like yeah, such a great cover of that song. Yeah, I I really um, I like I like that that soundtrack a lot, and it's got like the great uh, the songs from David Bowie's the Outside album, which is one of my favorite albums by him. Yeah. Yep, um, I'm deranged. And it's got like, yeah. yeah, I'm deranged, and it's got like uh, one of my favorite Marilyn Manson songs, the Apples and Sodom one. Yep, yep, I know. Yeah, of course, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I really like this one, the Firewalk with Me. Like, such a fucking dark movie. Like, I remember the first time I watched it, and it got done. I just felt like violated, kind of. You know, like it was so like. When you get to the end, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's like it reveals the whole what was going on, and it's just really depressing and heavy, you know. Yeah, it's a very, very heavy movie, you know. Yeah, it's uh, like, that the whole you know, damn, even the uh, Twin Peaks season three. Once again, you know, it's still a lot of it still feels like it takes place in the fifties, you know. Yeah, he has a kind of quality with, like, the, the dialogue and stuff, you know, like, kind of stilted, sometimes kind of like, uh, oh, golly, type of dialogue, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> and, and, like, in the world, that the, uni- the universe that David Lynch exists in, there's, like, always a good diner that's open 24 hours a day that has great pie and coffee and uh, 
just that sensibility, uh, that kind of suburban, you know, vibe, you know, is, is always been like plays big in all of his films, it seems. Right, but it was like this undercurrent of existential dread, dread yep. going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like those two things juxtaposing each other are, are um, you know, it's like a really a, a, an interesting conflict. I like that. Like, um, I remember the first time I saw Blue Velvet, I was really struck by, I mean, I was a teenager, I think, when I saw that, or not even a teenager. I was probably adolescent. I don't remember exactly when I saw it. I definitely saw it before I saw Mulholland Drive. Yeah. Um, and I saw Mulholland Drive not when the theaters when it first came out on when it first came out on uh, D V D. I remember watching it. And um I'm pretty sure a couple of before. I, I I kinda saw them around the same time. But um I remember being struck by Blue Velvet with like the whole theme of like the you know, you got this perfect suburban world and then it kind of sinks down underneath and it's going to show you the rot underneath this suburban world. But it's kind of saying these things exist simultaneously. Yeah. I don't think he's quite saying that the suburban world is at it is, is essentially this rotten thing. He's saying that I think that they, they exist at the same time. You'll have people who are genuine good people in this kind of suburban world, but then you also have this, this other side too, the dark side, this rot and, and violence and crime and stuff existing alongside it, you know. I saw I saw Blue Velvet at a very interesting point in my life, actually, because I I saw it in the eighties, like when it came out, and um, you know, I I was a uh, you know a teenager when I saw that film, and uh, I just gotten out of high school, and and it was that sort of vibe of like the world leaving one world of safety. And then move, moving, going out into the into the world of potential danger, you know. And then also, during my years at high school too, I experienced like most most of my you know very very safe, you know, nothing crazy happened to me when I was a kid. But like, I would see glimpses of things that were um, unpleasant, you know, like certain families or people that I knew, certain friends from school. I can tell that their life was different than mine. Like they had a different experience and that's what blue velvet made me think about because it takes place in a small town i grew up in a small town and I, it made me reflect back to some of the darker stories i heard about people you know like this this one girl i went to high school with she was a year or two older than me and, and they found her dead and she was raped and you know all this stuff like that you know what i mean like they right. found her in a stream you know and and um just stories that were way out on the fringe and people that I didn't know personally that I'd seen around and the, the kind of fucked up stuff that ended up happening to them. And it just, yeah, it kind of made me think about like how like you live in this life, this world where things are safe and everything's taken care of and, and there's good people around you. But then you could just have easily walked down the wrong alleyway in life and had bad parents or had like negative things happen to you or things that you never really recover from. And that's what... That's what Twin Peaks makes me think about, you know. Yeah, I definitely think Twin Peaks and Blue Velvet have that theme a lot. Like, I mean, like, particularly, like, um, um, I do think with Twin Peaks, you do have that quality of, uh, of, like, you know, on the surface, like, her life is, like, perfect. Like, she's, like, the, you know cheerleader like prom queen but and like her dad you know they just seem like they're like this like perfect family but really he's like raping her and yeah. like she's like doing drugs and like prostituting herself and stuff you know what i mean like there's this really like dark side to it you know and um yeah and then, you know just small towns like that i mean that that the stuff goes on you know what i mean like people don't think that was just small town life or whatever but like usually small town life uh, has a has a real br dark side to it you know definitely man and then probably my favorite character is audrey horn like i remember when uh <laughs> like it, it was it was like the kind of girls that i liked when i was in high school these like weirdo chicks who were like into old music and dressing differently and you know and like i don't know just unique 
girls, you know, and I was like, oh, Audrey Horn, man. She's like exactly like these cool like ladies that I knew when I was growing up. Right. Like they kind of, yeah, like, like kind of quirky and cool and like in the, yeah, she, I always liked her as a character. Yeah. I think uh, she was absent from season three though, right? We didn't really, did we see her in season three? I don't think she's in season three now. Yeah. Oh, I wonder. Yeah. You know. Or did she show up right at the end? You know, I, I, I'm, I can't remember. I can't remember either. Yeah. I, I think she might show up right at the end, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. The, um, I only seen season three once, like when it came out. So it's been, I don't barely remember. I need, that's one I need to revisit. I've been planning on buying that Blu-ray box set that has all three seasons. Yeah. You know, it's funny. <laughs> it's like going back to, uh, <laughs> guys like us, man, like they got our number, man, when it comes to spending money. Cause, uh, <laughs> I, I remember when the, the gold box came out of, of Twin Peaks, you know? The yeah. DVD, I'm like, oh, this is all I'm going to need, man, ever. You know, now there's like, oh, all three seasons. Are, <laughs> there's like another, you know, 10 years later, there's another one that I have to get now. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that, and that DVD, a Blu ray one is cool. Like, it has all three seasons and has like a whole bunch of extras. Like, yeah. A whole bunch of shit. It's pretty cool. Like, I mean, it's I'll, not I'll, that expensive I'll, either. I'll definitely get, I'm, I'm definitely going to get that. I, I mean, I, eyeball on that one for sure, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we're getting all the Criterion ones. I'm trying to collect all the Criterions. Like, I still need to get like um, Eraserhead, and I need to get Mahal and Drive still. Yeah, um, yeah. I like, have Eraserhead on DVD. I should get. I, I mean, you know, this once again. I have it on DVD. Uh, you know, <laughs> I have like <laughs> I'll get the Criterion. You know, and probably another ten years, another one will come out with different stuff on it. I'll probably end up getting that too. Yeah, I always like getting like the Criterion ones, like because they have extras and they all come with like these booklets and stuff. Like, yeah. it's worth it, you know. Like, like yeah. I mean, uh, pretty much all the Lynch stuff I'm buying a second time on Blu-ray, but it's worth. You know, for Lynch, it's worth it to me. You know, because he's like my favorite, one of my favorite directors, and it's like I want to have all this, all this stuff and um, like uh, you know, it's funny because I I remember seeing. Blue Velvet, but the thing that really made me a, a big fan of Lynch was seeing um, Mulholland Drive. Yeah, yeah, I mean that, and, that's that's a great great movie. Yeah, it, it's funny because it's not actually my my favorite is Lost Highway, but Mulholland Drive was the one that really got me into Lynch. Like I remember my dad rented it, and we were watching it, and it's funny because my dad fell asleep actually, and I was just like watching it like. Uh, he ended up like watching it again, like the next day. But I, I watched it and was just like entranced by it. You know what I mean? Like just like the whole feeling of it, the whole vibe of it. Like I just was like in in love with that feeling. And um, I forget who, what's her name? Um, actress, uh, the brunette in the movie, or uh, I always forget her name, man. I just remember Naomi yeah. Watts, but I always forget the brunette actress's name. I love her though. Like I had a biggest crush on oh, her. Oh man! In that movie. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, she's beautiful. Like, Actually, I mean that's 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 Lynch is known for having beautiful women in all of his movies. Yeah, and she's like definitely the most beautiful one, and like just really, this that whole movie just like just like and kind of entranced me, you know, and and um, that was really what what solidified me as like a Lynch fan was seeing that movie. The ladies of David Lynch, man. You know, Isabella Rossellini, like she's been my heartthrob for my, most of my life, actually. Her, you know, there's always like yeah. beautiful women in all the films. Laura Dern, you know, the list goes on. Yeah, you know, and uh, um, it's funny too because he always has one brunette and one blonde. Yeah. And I thought it was funny. I think what's, what's cool though is in Lost Highway, she's the same actress playing both parts you know <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah yeah She's uh lost highway that. is my favorite uh that and blue velvet are my two favorites actually yeah yeah um yeah it's hard for me to choose between blue velvet and Alejandra because i like love them both but probably blue velvet would be my favorite next to lost highway as well but yeah like lost highway is always been my favorite because it's just got such a dark you know, I'm a huge noir fan. You know, I really love noir movies. So it's like, you know, 
really hits on that for me, like the whole noir vibe, because it, that's just something that I've always like really liked since I was a kid. My dad showed me like Maltese Falcon and yeah. Big Sleep and all that kind yep. of shit, you know, like. Yeah, there's just something I, about I, L.A., man. L.A. has it's like baked into the 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 atmosphere of that city. You know, you mentioned you know Maltese Falcon and like the James Elroy you know novels and things like that. You know, the big nowhere. Yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of James Elroy. Like I have all his novels. Like um, I read like I've read L.A. Confidential multiple times. Like that's like my favorite of his novels. Like. Um, like I love, like his his writing is so like intense and and um and cool you know like it's like the statico and tense like dialogue you know just yeah and he really brings to life this this time of L A back in like you know the forties and fifties you know what I mean and it's such a fascinating time it's something I've always had this real big interest in is 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 you know old Hollywood L A and like you know L A back in the 20s to the 50s you know, that whole era yeah. i think is just like a really fascinating era and and um i mean, probably probably I, I get that a lot because my dad was really into that era and he you know he spent a lot of time in la and san francisco and um he had a really big interest in that whole era as well so i probably kind of came upon it that way but you know it's like it's a very like entrancing period of time to sort of, like read about and learn about and and particularly watch like the old movies and watch movies like like Confidential that bring it to life and and James Elroy and stuff, you know. Yeah, definitely, man. It's like I feel like Elroy is almost the same way Lynch creates an alternative world to live in. James Elroy's version of Hollywood and L.A. is like an alternative reality too. You know, some of the factual stuff is a little bit. He takes a lot of license with that, you know, too as well. You know, the yeah, certain definitely. scandals that didn't may or may not have actually existed. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, I uh, I really loved. Um, did you ever read the Black Dahlia? Oh the yeah, novel? Man, that, that's a yeah. That's yeah. I feel was it the Big Nowhere, the Black Dahlia, and L.A. Confidential are like kind of like the the big L.A. like novels that he wrote. I feel like. Yeah, and then there's a uh, white noise as well as white the noise, finish yeah. of that that quadrology. He and he swung back around. I have the Perfidia novel that's set in the uh, during World War II, um, and it has um, oh fuck, what's his name? The the Irish uh, detective. Oh um, yeah, I forgot that dude. He's name. like the main character. Yeah, yeah, he's so great. Like, and uh, and that movie, the guy who they had play him in the movie was like perfect for that part. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. when we first started. The first time I went to Los Angeles back in like the '90s or something, I was like, like tripping out on just I'd never been there before, you know. Just I went out out there on tour, and it was like, you know, thinking about James Elroy and like all this like cool like noir sort of stuff, driving down the Sunset Strip and all that in a van, you know, and feeling very much out of place because it's like, you know it's just different you know we're i'm we're from we were like new yorkers you know from the east coast we're like all pale and ugly and dark you know what i mean and like <laughs> you go to like la and everyone's all like healthy looking with good good skin and everything you know what i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah it's a different vibe <laughs> like we we you know there was a the show we played was like an earlier show so like we were like looking to get some food so we were just like sitting in some spot somewhere and i was like man we you know we'd stick out like sore thumbs here man it's really funny yeah it's it's um definitely a different vibe. I mean, it's just, it's its own thing there. I would not want to live there though, that's for sure. Like, but it's cool to visit. And the um, yeah, I just love, I, I'm a big fan of um, like Raymond Chandler as well, like the author. Have you ever read? Oh yeah, yeah, stuff? definitely, man. Yeah, I mean that his yeah. classic. You know, that's a classic noir stuff. You know, he was a he was a big backer of of uh, weird fiction and horror fiction as well, though. I and, didn't know uh, that about him actually. Yeah, like he did, uh, he, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but he edited like a collection of weird fiction stories that was had like a lot of the greats in there that I heard about. Let me, let me ask you a question. Oh. Did did they, did Penguin do something with Raymond Chandler recently? Or maybe not I'm recently, not sure. but I have a feeling that someone, somehow he got acknowledged as being like a legitimate uh, like author in 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 the literary world of uh, the United States of an American you know literary guy because you know like a yeah. lot of times they don't 
they don't count genre fiction in that stuff. You know, like if you're a genre writer, you, you're somehow like a second class citizen in the literary world, you know? Yeah, well, he definitely was because, um, let's see, I have these editions of his work. It's, um, trying to remember, let me look real quick. Uh, trying to remember what the, um, here it is. So, you know how they have the, uh, the American, there's like this whole like American library thing. Ah, that's what I was thinking about actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, um, yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah, the Library of America. Yep, Library of America. Yeah. Yep. I have. Uh, <clears throat> they do. A, they did a two-volume set of all of his work that I have. It has his um, stories and novels. I mean, I have his novels in a few different collections because I got like a old like uh, leather-bound edition that has a bunch, like four of his novels, and I have them all in paperback as well. But yeah, I have these. Yeah, those those library uh of Library of America. I have um I have a Shirley Jackson one, I think. And it's like the 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 covers all kind of look the same, right? Yeah, they're all the same. Like the one I ones I have are hardcover and they're just like this kind of like blue, you know, like binding and like a slipcase, you know. Yeah, there's like a uniformity to the way that they're the the package, you know what I mean? Like the covers and the dust jackets are all like they have a, a very like strong like design sense with that stuff. Yeah, when they have like the one the ones I have, they I have a couple different kinds. Like they have the one that that's like the blue and a, and a flip case is like I think maybe it's a more deluxe edition. And then they have the other one that's like a black cover with like a red, white, and blue stripe on them. I think those are the ones that I've seen more of. I think with the red, white, and blue stripe. Yeah. The, that's like the more common one. That's like the cheaper version. Yeah, that's why it's those are the ones that are in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad got these ones like when um, they first when that first happened, like whenever that was, I think would have been like early two thousands probably. Yeah, I, like, something like that. That's when he got those. Yeah, the because uh, he was a big fan of Raymond Chandler, so like, and I think I think uh, maybe Dashiell Hammett was included in that. I'm not sure. But there, there's a Library of America Dashiell Hammett too. I don't know. Oh. I'm not sure. I know. I do know Raymond Chandler though because I have those. You know. Yeah, Rennie. Rennie's a big uh, crime fiction pulp fan too. I, you know, it's, he likes noirs. He's like turning me on to a bunch of stuff like this. I mean, I, I mean Raymond Chandler. Like I read him when I was in high school, but you know, like other, other definitely writers and stuff. Definitely worth uh, going back and rereading. I reread. All of his stuff and all of Dashiell Hammett, um, uh, Jim Thompson. Oh yeah, the, yeah, the Killer Inside Me and uh, you know Grifters and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's great. And then um, oh, what's his name? I'm trying to look real quick. Um, uh, James M. Kane, real big fan of James M. Kane. He's a fucking great writer. Double Indemnity and Postman Always Rings Twice and stuff. I've never read any of his. I've seen the movies, uh, but I've never read any of the the text. Uh, and I, I've never read Dashiell Hammett either, believe it or not. Oh, really? Yeah, Dashiell Hammett's great. Like, uh, um, Red Harvest and, uh, you know, like, The Maltese Falcon. Like, those mm -hmm. are all great novels. Yeah. Um, the, um, yeah, I'm be, I definitely, definitely recommend if you're into like noir at all to check out um Hammett and also yeah James and Kane like Kane like his stuff classic like I have a, I have a whole shelf and just like noir stuff so it's like uh and I have a couple really cool books about film noir like um there's this book that I have it's called um uh Dark City oh wow that's like that's one of my favorite ones it, and it, that one's cool because it goes through like kind of by, like, the type of story, uh -huh. essentially. So, you know, because there's, like, different kind of, like, tropes with, like, noir noir movies, you know, and so it kind of goes, like, through the different ones and talks about and has a lot of great stills from the movies. And, you know, uh, I just, I'm a big fan of that whole, like, style, like, that's, like, based off of, like, the old, um, 
you know, all stems back from like German expressionist film, you know, and yes. some of the creators of kind of noir, are like, you know, Fritz Lang and people like that, you know, who started in the German expressionist and came over and started doing, you know, sometimes they did new versions of their old movies like M, you know, like, and, um, uh, Blue Angel and stuff were all done, um, again in Hollywood. Like, I feel like that's where a big part of the whole, uh, film noir thing really stemmed from started was this kind of like element of the German expressionist, like, um, German crime fiction and stuff. Yeah. That, that's like, and, yeah, that, that's like a, like, yeah, for sure. Everyone I think acknowledges that for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think it's an interesting thing about film noir is that it was kind of like, um, just kind of a look down genre, you know, both in fiction and film for a while in the States, you know, but it was fun. It's funny because it was like really like the French who like brought a, you know, brought a back revival of interest in it, you know, and the yeah. Yeah. 70s, I was just going to mention know? that actually the French really went hard in that direction. There's, um, I think arrow and definitely the criterion channel have like tons of like awesome French noir films on there. Yeah, because I think the French really got on the noir train like the fifties and sixties, and yeah, um, and then I think like between that and then people like Martin Scorsese, you know, in the seventies, like he was like a real, you know, big like advocate for film noir, you know. Yeah, I love Martin Scorsese, man. Like, because he's such a fan of film and so knowledgeable, and and is a big advocate for like you know just like quality shit, you know. Yeah, particularly genre film. Like, I, uh, you remember, I don't remember what the thing was. My dad had these, uh, I got these tapes. It was like Martin Scorsese doing this kind of like film history thing. Hmm. Okay. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It was kind of like a journey through like, uh, uh, cinema or something type of thing that he did. It was like a pretty big set. It was like 10 tapes or something. And he went through like westerns and, film noir and and horror and all kinds of different ones, you know, and talk and he was talking about these movies and then um you know, showing clips from them and stuff like that and, and analyzing them and stuff. It was pretty cool. Um I can't remember what's called but I mean uh and sometimes he's kind of be also like bring up how ways that he was inspired by these things in his film, like, you know, like like taxi driver having like very noir elements and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Like, but, you know, it's a great, like kind of more Manhattan, New York style of film noir in a way, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I typically think of the LA when I think of noir, New York really has a t different feel to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of a different kind of noir in a way. Yeah. Like, that's like the New York gritty, like New York style. Um, like, uh, Nelson, was it Nelson Al Algernon? I think, uh, man with the golden arm, you know, or walk on the wild side. I'm trying to remember his name. Yeah. I don't remember the name either. Like his, all of his stuff is like New York and it was very kind of low life crime stuff. You know what I mean? Well, dude, it was great talking and, uh, you know, just uh, looking forward to doing the next uh, Eldritch Tales, and uh, yeah, really we'll excited doing... about covering Wagner. Yeah, we cool to talk in the pines. I just finished reading that, like, and uh, like really blown away by that story, and kind of went a direction I didn't expect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously we're going to get into it, but it's like it's uh, just a great horror story, you know, ghost story, but also. It's a lot of, a lot of like Wagner's horror tales have like this really personal twist to it, you know what I mean? And it, it talks yeah. about like actual like stuff that you know, like Cain is a barbarian, a magical barbarian, immortal, you know. So there's not a lot of um life kind of commentary that goes on in those stories. But uh Right, yeah. Like a lot of his horror fiction deals with like the complexity of like living a life and like, you know, more contemporary times which i think is uh in that story particularly in the pines it kind of touches on a lot of stuff for me at least yeah it's dealing with like grief and all kinds of stuff and um 
And, uh, yeah, I really like the way that it draws upon the idea of, like, desolation. And that seems to be a theme throughout his work, you know, like going to, you know, loneliness and, death, yeah. you know, like. Yep. And and there's a, I like the, even though the short, the story is only, like, what, like 20 pages long or something like that, but there's a prologue to it. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that was. That, very cool. And it, that was amazing. It was, like, a, some of the most beautiful writing I've read, you know what I mean? That prologue was awesome. And, uh, you know, just. Yeah, it was uh, like almost. I was almost thinking for when we cover it to have you just read the whole pro. <laughs> the whole pro, all right, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. No problem, man. I would love to. But it's, um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it just touches on that loneliness and, and just desolation. And, and there's also just uh, like following like another, your your dark muse into ruin, you know. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about all this stuff. Man. We should record this thing soon, definitely. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll hit it pretty soon. I mean, um Maybe, you know, maybe in a couple of weeks, like, uh, maybe a week, uh, yeah. you know, we'll figure it out, but, you yeah. know, like, we'll uh, coordinate for sure. Yeah, we'll coordinate. Yeah, I'll definitely hit it soon. I really want to talk about that story and, and uh, get into it. Yeah, I'm probably going to so, re- reread kind of it soon. again just to get the all some of the details down and stuff, but, you know, it's, it's, it's short, so I'll probably knock it out in an you know, hour or so, maybe. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I, a lot of times I, when we cover the stories, I try to read them a couple of times if yeah. I can, depending mm-hmm. on how long it is, you know, like, um, like some of the stories, I mean, some of the stories we've covered, like I know like so well that, but then, you know, it's still good to cover them, you know, read them again. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'll, I'll try to read, read them a few times. So I'll definitely reread it before, like particularly closer to when we cover it, if we cover it in a couple of weeks, you know, so it's like. I'm yeah, like, that, uh, that was my first reading of that one. I'd never read that one before. Oh, really? Yeah, that was the, the first time. Collection? Nope, that one was not in the collection that I have. Uh, so that was my first reading of that. That's a great story. I, I mean, we were originally talking about covering maybe Fix or something more famous, but I really like the idea of covering something a little bit less known. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Sticks, you is, know? that's still on the table for maybe later on, you know what I mean? Because that, that is kind of like an iconic story by him. If there, if if you can call any of his work iconic, you know, I mean, I, I can, but it's like most people fucking probably don't even know who the hell he is, you know? Yeah, well... Yeah, I mean, I like. I definitely want to end up covering pretty much everything in this, in this collection, so it will definitely hit sticks. But I think for the first story, it's good to cover something a little bit, um, you know, a little bit less well known, give people like, you know, a little insight in that. I think the stick story, uh, a lot of people will kind of see it as like a some influence on maybe Blair Witch Project, which I think is interesting. Yeah, you know, man, but, I, I like. Who knows? You know what I mean. Blair, there's so I don't little. Know if those guys read that story. Yeah, dude, yeah. I would be surprised. Like those, th- th- that that movie's like super overrated, in my opinion. You know. Yeah, it's... I don't think it's like the greatest movie. No. I think, um, I guess I could see them maybe uh, the sticks, like you know, um, the way the sticks are described in the story, kind of sound like the things, the little like stick figures they made in that movie. You know, I guess that's probably what people are yeah. connecting the dots. That that I don't think the yeah. overall story is the same because no. yeah. Also, like I know this, goes in this a different direction. When I used to work at this place called Enchantments in New York City, and um, it was all these like people into witchcraft like work there, and you know they sold like uh, you know they made like candles and um, they sold like you know sage and you know and all this like esoteric stuff and tarot cards and uh they had readings there and little functions around it and stuff and um this this one of the people that worked there didn't had never read anything wasn't even really i mean hadn't read any of the stuff that we're talking about and completely hadn't even seen blair witch project but completely on his own came up with these sort of sticks basically that looked like they were in blair witch and true detective so, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I can see why people might think that, but part of me is like, you know, I just think it's it's one of these things that exists out there in our collective unconscious, you know, to make something like that. Yeah, I think probably too, because I mean, I never heard the creator of that. I mean, granted, I haven't delved too deep into Blair Watch Project because it's not like one of my favorite things, but I don't, I never heard them acknowledge the story. I mean, if no. they say, oh yeah, that's like where we got the idea from, then like okay cool but 
they might even have a bit more respect for them. <laughs> they never, uh, they never acknowledge any any written material. They just talked about, um, and I don't even know the folklore if that's even something they made up either. You know, I think I think the folklore is all stuff they made up. Yeah, so the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, because um, uh, my friend's wife, she's from that area, like in Maryland and everything, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, oh, the whole like the whole thing is gonna made up. It's just, it's kind of like it sounds like a urban legend almost a way that that would be real i mean i've been um uh i've been on this like binge recently with I, that podcast i sent you the monsters among us one yeah i've been i've been listening to that actually i enjoy it yeah i've been i've been binge, like binging my way through that like i, I just kind of really into like like people with weird stories you know whether they're true or not is like kind of um, not important but sometimes i like the way that he does it because it's like people um you know they're telling their own story with their own voice and i feel like that makes it a little easier because you can tell some people are telling their story and they're like genuinely like scared to just even talk about their experience you know what i mean yeah it it uh it referenced to me it's almost you know like like coast to coast you know like i used to love coast to coast and uh you know listen to those stories and also there was another podcast called um the shockwaves podcast uh it's not free anymore, so I stopped listening to it. And uh, a lot of that would be call-ins and people telling stories about how they saw this, like a fucking werewolf or something, you know, or like <laughs> they were abducted, you know, that kind of stuff. I've always loved that kind of stuff, always. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a sucker for all that kind of, like, cause I'm, like, listening to people. I like this one because he, he, I think he kind of probably weeds out some of the real crackpot, like, yeah. calls that he probably gets so, because sometimes with coast to coast, some of those people are like, <laughs> oh yeah, they're nut jobs, like, like okay, yeah. nut jobs, yeah, yeah. You got like a like, an, a, an open line to like in the middle of the night for someone to call in for sure, yeah. I, I mean, that was part of the fun of coast to coast. So it was like you never knew, like you would probably get some like nut job like telling y'all like crazy ass story, but you know, like I do like this, this podcast because he's kind of like weeds out some of the stuff and. But I, I love hearing about all the, like, kind of X-Files type of subjects, you know, like, yeah. all the stuff like aliens, uh, you know, ghosts and all these things. And, you know, and he does, this guy, on some of the episodes he does, he does uh, ones about, like, people's, like, kind of, like, uh, local uh, local stories, you know? Yeah, yeah. Call yep. in and tell. I caught a couple of those, yeah. Yeah, and I kind of it was like kind of fun, like because people would come and call and tell their you know local uh, ghost story, the local like legends of their neighborhood or whatever. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff on that one, man. I I um I've been I've been exploring it, you know, that during I'll, that's you know at the work week starting up again tomorrow. It's like I'm probably gonna listen to a bunch more at my desk here, you know. Yeah, I've been like you know working and listening to that and. Uh, I don't. I love that, and you know they they make bring Dick into like uh, Skinwalker, the Wendigos, and Bigfoot, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. I I kind of like. I just like hearing all these stories, like, and then some of them like to seem more rational, or you kind of like, uh, it makes you wonder sometimes, like, you know, what is possible in the world, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Cool. So, uh, yeah, this during the week we'll coordinate and we'll we'll, we'll get that that wa- the first of many um, Wagner episodes scheduled. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely get that. And uh, thanks for having me on again on episode one black. Of course, man. And we'll be doing this many times in the future. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. You know, it's great to have, great to go back and forth and uh, everything. It's kind of kind of nice to just do a, a whatever you know not themed kind of conversation because we're usually doing the elder tales or yeah. whatever you know so well like... I, I wanted to follow up because you know we we kind of talked right around the time you were launching and you know i just figured we're almost you know about just about a year into it with your with soul Knox, and I figured we just kind of you know do like a follow-up on it you know what i mean yeah and i i'm still uh, planning on getting the conan one going like to be like maybe a monthly or two times a month podcast but, but i am um, still haven't i'm gonna try to get a logo together and all this kinds of stuff like 
So oh, yeah. once I get that together, I'm going to launch that one too. Is like, I know I, I, but you know, I'm not going to, I don't know. Like for me, like I don't really have time to do like two weekly podcasts, strictly do that one. Cause it's going to be a lot more like research. Yeah. Episode, that's like, you know? there, so, there's a lot of research with that, man. It's like, you're going to have, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's definitely not like an off the cuff kind of thing. Yeah. So the, so the, so the Howard Conan one will be more like once a month or every other week type of one once I launch that. And, you know, so that's definitely coming, but I, I thought it definitely was a good idea to launch soul Knox first and get in the group with doing this. And, and now I'm starting to get to the point where I actually have like a, uh, uh, episode lot, like a backlog, you know, which is great. I've been like trying to get myself to that point, try to keep myself there where I am a few weeks out. Cause, um, That's the I hustle, definitely had man. a few times. Yeah. I had, I've had a more than a few times where coming down the line, everything like falls through, like all, the, and, and then you're like, well, I, fuck, I don't got anything for this episode. I just have to do, figure out, make up some things on my own, you know, like I've had to happen a few times. So I'm trying to like, uh, yeah, do the hustle, avoid that. So, you know, I'm getting in the groove of that as well. Hell yeah, man. All right, dude. Well, uh, we'll be in touch later this week. And uh, thanks Perfect, everyone dude. for listening. And we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good night, Dean. Take care.